uh, was already in Europe before researchers in South Africa actually detected it. There's now confirmed cases in at least 20 countries worldwide as experts try to determine whether vaccines are effective against the variant. Deborah Pata has been spending uh, time with scientists doing some crucial research into the variant's origins and joins me now. Thank you so much for joining us, Deborah. Um, the Omicron variant was first discovered by scientists in South Africa. How did they come to discover this variant? What were they noticing about cases, perhaps patients, that led them to believe there may be another variant out there? Well, Anne-Marie, I think the discovery really highlights not just the excellent science in South Africa, but the strong systems of cooperation that are in place for early detection of variants. For a while now, South Africa's daily rate of infection was really, really low. South Africa was, you know, quite relaxed, even hoping it might actually avoid the worst of another wave over the festive season. Then mysteriously, cases started increasing rapidly just over a week ago. The principal investigator of the country's network for genomic surveillance, Professor Tulio Dolivera, knew from past experience, because this isn't the first variant that they've identified, that this was an alarm bell, that the call was sent out and should be sent out for greater variant surveillance and for technicians at private labs to start watching what was happening. And they did. They started noticing something very puzzling that the tests were coming back positive, but showing an element on, on the virus's telltale spike protein um, was actually missing, signaling that perhaps it had undergone a major change. Dolivero um, the, has the person in charge of the lab in Durban, which then sequenced it and found what they're describing as the most mutated virus they had ever seen. And this all happened in a very, very short space of time. The uh, mutation has over 50 mutations, and more than 32 of those are in the actual spike protein, the part that attaches to human cells. Then, within 36 hours of this discovery, they had informed the world, and then one hour after that, they'd already begun testing it against existing vaccines. It's pretty impressive, and I think that's another part of why this network is so valuable in South Africa, because next door to the lab where they sequenced it is the African Health Research Institute, headed up by virologist Alex Segal, and he is now growing live Omicron, which um, he hopes to have results on how they perform um, against the vaccine in about a week's time or just over a week's time. We spoke to him on Monday, and he told us that he's worried but he does believe that existing vaccines will be able to protect against hospitalization and serious illness. Anne-Marie? Uh, just out of curiosity, what is the current situation of the coronavirus uh, in South Africa? You mentioned that it's, you know, South Africa kind of felt like it was doing quite well. I think I had read the other day that vaccination rates are actually quite low, though there is a, an abundance of vaccine that is available. So what is the sort of the current status? Well, I think this is the most um, frustrating part for South Africa and other countries in the Southern African region who've been slapped with travel bans. I mean, this should have been a triumph of science, but as uh, one person who's advising the World Health Organization said, the new wave of restrictions is really almost like a failure of humanity. At present, the situation is 35% in this country are fully vaccinated. Over a week ago, South Africa had well, maybe more than two weeks, really, a positivity rate of just under 1%, and that's now increased to over 10%. Mm. So I think it shows how quickly the virus is spreading. Um, and the daily average was around just over 200 infections a day, and that is now over 3,000. The death toll, fortunately, is still fairly low, but obviously the country is bracing itself um, for the worst, having experienced a very deadly third wave in June and July, which was fueled then by the Delta variant. Now, I think the expectation is that there's going to be almost a turf war between Omicron and Delta. And it's unclear how widespread Omicron is at the moment in the country. Up until now, it's mostly been confined to the economic hub around Johannesburg, where I'm talking to you from. And the word on the ground from doctors dealing with the new infections is that so far, and I stress so far, symptoms appear to be mild. 
but experts caution that that might be because it is a majority of young South Africans who perhaps are more sociable at present who seem to be the first group infected by the strain. As I said, 35% are mm. fully vaccinated, but I think there's a rate of about 60% in this country who've actually had coronavirus before over um, the past six months or so. So that was hoped it would provide some kind of natural immunity. And there's deep resentment over the travel bans. Um, people saying that excellent science mm. should be applauded, not punished. And many saying that the restrictions are, are xenophobic, really, and that um, we should have been, that this country really should have been hailed as an example of transparency. Well, I mean, you can understand that there you are have the scientists in South Africa being proactive. They're the ones that notice that there's a possibility that there might be a mutation and identify this thing. And now we're learning that even though there are travel bans in place, there's a likelihood that this particular variant was already sort of in other countries in the world prior to its sort of official discovery by the scientists in South Africa. Um, but this does bring back the question of vaccine availability. Um, and that doesn't seem to be an issue in South Africa, but some of the surrounding countries in Southern Africa, some of the leaders certainly have complained about wealthier countries hoarding vaccine. What is the situation with some of these other countries in Southern Africa and access to the vaccine? That's a very good question, Anne-Marie. We've had many discussions about vaccine inequality, and Omicron has certainly injected itself right back into that debate. Um, for more than a year, as you know, health experts have been saying nobody is safe until everyone is safe, that if you don't vaccinate everyone around the world, the virus will mutate and come back to haunt us, even those in high-income countries, that even if you don't buy the moral argument, there's a self-preservation one, that the hoarding of vaccines by wealthy nations is um, bad for everyone, including those countries. And all it does is really perpetuate the kind of inequalities. The situation is still very bleak. One in four health workers on this continent has received their shots. Less than 7% of the continent is fully vaccinated. Now, let's get to those countries who've been banned by other nations from travel. Mozambique. 89% are unvaccinated, Angola 92%, and they're crying out for vaccines. Um, and, you know, what has happened is that health workers are up in arms, they say, about what amounts to almost a gaslighting, they're calling it, of African countries, blaming them by saying the problem isn't supply but vaccine hesitancy. Well, yes, there is hesitancy. There's hesitancy in parts of Africa, there's hesitancy everywhere in the world. The main problem still remains access and distribution. It's been suggested, and you were, you were quoting those um, points, that South Africa has enough vaccines and it's the lack of take-up. That's true. South Africa does have enough vaccines, but it has enough vaccines for now. It's turned down offers for more vaccine, mm. it says, because other countries need them more and they have enough vaccines for now. If you consider the, the stats here, and this is according to the um, African Union's Vaccine Delivery Alliance and other expert data groups, the two countries at the center of this debate, Botswana and South Africa. Botswana has already administered 86% of its supply. South Africa has used 78% of the doses that it bought. So, you know, a far higher figure than I think a lot of wealthier nations. And compared to the US, the UK and Europe, we're hearing reports from data groups that it's anticipated that 100 million vaccines that are about to expire could be destroyed by the end of the year because they've been hoarded and haven't been used up. Um, and so I think that remains one of the key issues. Many African countries also have logistic problems. They just can't get these vaccines out. We know, for example, Nigeria received 1.5 million vaccines last week, the expiry date today. So yes, some countries oh. have hesitancy, just like everywhere in the world, but there are still big, big issues with supply and getting those into people's arms. Deborah, thank you very much. All those details really put the challenges into focus. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So to the nation's highest court now, and in just a few hours, the Supreme Court will hear arguments in an abortion rights case that's considered the most significant.